speaker is Michael Stevens, which is already here. I will briefly present Michael. Michael Ske is a communication media department in Loughborough University, UK. Even though I was there, I don't remember how to say it. Loughborough University at UK. Uh, Dr. Michael Ske is a senior lecturer in uh, communication media and has research interests in. Um, sorry? In. Uh, oh, sorry, I skipped. Okay. Media communications, nationalism, every day. Right, but I want to be accurate and just as I had here. Sorry. Uh, I'll give you a mo one more minute, Matt. But uh, <laughs> interest in the following areas nationalism, cosmopolitanism, everyday nationhood, media events and ritual, communication and sport, discourse theory. Uh, he has published numerous journal articles and two books uh, National Belonging in Everyday Life and Everyday Nationhood with Marco Antonsi on these topics. And Michael is going to present the talk that you see here. Michael, please, the floor is yours. The Zoom is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me OK? Very good. Good. OK. So first of all, I, I, I want to apologize for not being there. I was looking forward to this for two years. <laughs> and then on Friday, I did a test. And for the first time uh, in the pandemic, it turned out positive. So I'm, I'm really sorry I'm not there. Um, I'm, I'm very disappointed not to be able to, to share this with you in person. But thank you for Danny and Hiski for um, allowing me to talk to you um, via my study. Um, so in terms of my research, I guess I've been interested in, in two main questions over the years. The first one is, how is it possible to view individual nations and the world as a world of nations? So, you know, given the size and the complexity and the diversity and the internal um, struggles within particular nations, how can we see nations as, as if they are these concrete entities? So that's one of the questions that's kind of um, fired my research. And the second one is, why do national forms of organization and belonging matter to particular groups? And in the talk today, what I want to do is, is focus on um, events that are designed to celebrate or commemorate the nation. And I want to start from um, Anderson's, where it's the most celebrated book on nationalism of all time. I want to start off with Anderson's famous statement about nations being imagined communities. And I want to argue contra the national to answer, I mean, I think it's a, a really important book, highly influential, very important, but actually thinking of nations in terms of imagined communities. Oh. Oh, sure. is the time, nations are not imagined. And I've drawn on work in anthropology in particular, people like David Kirchner, for example, <coughs> who focuses on people's practices, people's activities, the way people come together, and his arguments that actually these are far more important in underpinning a sense of collective belonging, and in this case, a sense of national belonging. Um, so that actually we don't focus on processes of imagination, we focus on processes of representation, materialization. Uh, the ways in which we see nations, we hear nations, we discuss nations. And what I want to do, I mean, I think there's been quite a lot of work on the ways in which nations are represented and materialized through both hot and banal forms, and I haven't got much time, so I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time talking about them. I assume you are aware of, of Billig's um, seminal work on banal nationalism. And instead, what I want to do is, is turn my attention to what might be called national holidays and holy days. Because I think these are important um, uh, for a number of reasons. And I just want to briefly outline why I think these uh, events are important, not only in terms of representing the world as a world of nations, but also in allowing certain groups within the nation to feel that they are part of a broader collective community. So again, this isn't the process of imagination, 
It's a process of coming together. It's a process of doing things with other people. So I want to get away from that idea that these are, in Billy's terms, conventional carnivals of surplus emotion. I want to argue that these are actually really important to our sense of living in the world of nations and belonging to nations. And I draw on here, again, another anthropologist coming out of Israel, Don Hanselman, who talks about the importance of, for any community, that there are moments where members of that community can come together and celebrate and commemorate, and this is a really important term, as if these were actual entities, as if they were actually existing groups of people. And as I say, I think the individual events are important for people or certain people within the nation, but they are also important in representing the world as if it were a world of nations. And I think there's some good arguments. Uh, they fire kind of strength as well. And I also want to point um, to the importance of the media in relation to these events. Not only the mainstream media, but also increasingly digital technologies, so social media as well, in, in again representing these uh, representing nations as concrete entities and showing their significance to large numbers of people uh, around the globe. And I start off um, by drawing on, I'm not going to spend much time on this, on drawing on a, a quite uh, significant work in communication media studies called Media Events, written by Daniel Diane and Ellie Katz uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. The thing about this work I want to talk about is the fact that they draw on a, a Durkheimian perspective and they've been heavily criticized for this. And one of the things I want to say here is that we can't assume that these events to people and that the integrative function of a particular event needs to be studied empirically and we need to ask the question, who is integrated? Because there are major divisions within any society so that some groups may be integrated by an event and others may not be. So I think that's really important that we focus on processes of you know, hierarchies within the nation, um, the way in which power relations are um, displayed through certain events as well. So I've come up with this term ecstatic nationalism, um, which again draws on, on the idea of media events. And it's also, again, important to put forth this idea that these events may be designed to celebrate or commemorate a nation, but whether they do that or not is an empirical question. And these are opportunities, again, for recommitment to the nation, for people allowing them to display their uh, sense of national belonging, to have fun, to enjoy themselves, and again, the role of the media has been really important in this. Uh, a couple of quick examples of this. Uh, my wife is Dutch, so I always would like to slip in a, uh, an example from the Netherlands. So this is an annual uh, celebration in the Netherlands. Many countries, of course, have, have national holidays once or, or twice a year where people come together participate in particular activities, dress up in certain clothes. I mean, you can see here, um, this is the photo on the right, it's from Amsterdam. So people dress in orange, which is the national color of the Netherlands. Um, the royal family takes part. The major public service broadcasters are involved in um, showing what the royal family are doing. And of course, social media increasingly has a major role to play in representing these events. So I think one of the things that's often overlooked is the ways in which individuals themselves, not only through what they are wearing and what they are doing, but through what they are posting, what they are tweeting, show some degree of commitment to the nation during this heightened period of time. Second example um, I want to look at comes from uh, the Olympics 
2012 Olympics in London. And I think it's a pretty nice example that shows the role of the media in these processes. I thought it was interesting in, in John's talk that, yes, this is about local activities, people clapping on their doorstep, seeing their neighbours. <laughs> of course, when they, they pick up the paper the next day, they may see people around the country. They can see friends in other parts of countries discussing this or posting pictures of themselves talking uh, about what they're doing. So I think the role of the media needs to be emphasized. And what I want to say in relation to this um, example of the Olympics is that even if you're not interested in the Olympics, it is very hard to escape the coverage that the media devotes to this. So it, it kind of forms a point, a point of reference for everyone in the country. Whether interested in the event uh, or not. So I think, again, the role of the media is vital in, in thinking about how particular nations in a world of nations are concretized through these events. Uh, moving on. I could have had five more minutes, okay? Yeah, yeah, no worries. I'm gonna, oh, here we go. Okay, so um, a couple of quick points before I finish. I think it's really important that we think about how these events um, flag the relationship between what I've called the particular and the universal. So that we have individual nations within a world of nations. And these events are very good examples of what Sabina Mihal calls the grammar of nationhood. There is an expectation that each nation will have a flag, will have a head of state, will have a capital city, but will also have moments where it comes together to celebrate or commemorate particular events or people or places. And that these events are really important in representing the world as a world of nations that we can know about. Now, whether that be through something like a sporting mega event, or it may be that we come to know about the world through uh, a particular event in a, in a nation. So uh, Independence Day in the United States or uh, Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel, for example, or one of the big Chinese national celebrations. Um, so that we know that each individual nation will have moments where they come and celebrate and commemorate particular activities. And that, again, this represents the world as a world of nations. And I think this quote is quite interesting so that there are some nations within the world that are seen as slightly unstable, slightly problematic, but they too will have opportunities to demonstrate their nationness through participating in particular events. And just the final point I want to make now is, is to think about the significance of these events to people who participate in them. Now, I'm saying that everyone within France or Malaysia or England or Northern Ireland is equally um, equally passionate about these events. There will be some people who resist them. There will be some people who criticize them. But that because there are significant numbers taking part in these events, what do they get from participating? What particular emotions are associated with, with these events? Is it dual and narrative? And there's a, there's a couple of insights that I just want to flag up and then I'll stop talking. Some coming from anthropology and some coming from uh, social psychology. And this idea that by performing the nation, now this could be going out and waving a flag, it could be getting together with friends and drinking too many beers, but this idea that you may take part in a whole variety of different ways. Again, social media might be quite important in relation to this, but that you can see that other people are taking part. You can read the newspaper reports about this event 
And in the words of Barbara Blair, this idea that there is confirmation that the nation exists and that it matters to significant numbers of people. And the final couple of points I just want to make here is I've drawn on um, a couple of concepts from social psychology where they talk about this idea of movement synchronicity, where people moving at the same time, doing the same thing, celebrating the goal, taking part in a parade, is linked to strong feelings of being part of the community. And the, the second concept, and the final thing I want to say today, is this idea of entitativity, which also comes from social psychology, the degree to which a group is perceived to be like a coherent whole. And my argument here is that through participating in these activities, through watching media broadcasts, through looking at one's Facebook or, or Twitter feeds, the nation comes to be seen as if it was a more or less coherent entity. And this is again tied to a whole variety of positive emotions. Feelings of belonging are bolstered by these particular activities. And again, just want to reiterate the media's role in these processes. So thank you very much. I'm really sorry I couldn't be with you. And I'll try it down. Um, Michael, thank you very much. We're all clapping here, and we're going to take a couple of questions. Uh, well, I'm going to ask the people to come over here to make the question so that Michael can hear you better. Okay, Julia can start. Okay. We have time for about three or four questions. So I'm going to also allow some other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ben and Abel. <laughs> and Brad, are you? No, no. And Mark. Yeah, because it's here. Yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> hi, Michael. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello. Hi, I'm Julia. Hello. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, so would you differentiate, so how would you characterize the, the national rituals or events that actually bring people together? Because I can think of many national events and rituals that actually bring people apart and make subgroup identity salient and not national, not the national level salient. Do you? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, there, there are some events that are designed to bring the nation together that do exactly the opposite. So I, there's a good example of that from Malaysia, where they have a, a Malaysian national uh, day to celebrate. And, you know, the Malaysian ethnic group takes part in that, but the Indian and the Chinese ethnic groups don't. Do, do you so have I think any... there are, sorry, there are some events that may be designed as a national celebration that do exactly the opposite. And again, I would say it's an empirical question and it's interesting to look at the ones that do and the ones that don't. Okay. But I think that, you know, if you look at examples around the world, there are enough examples of these events that bring enough people together to make them significant to a sense of kind of national belonging. Yeah, so, so, so my question was whether you have any insight as to what characterizes the events that make the national categories salient versus the subgroup categories. Do, do, you, do you make any characterization of what is necessary to make an event such an not, event? No, not, not in terms of the events. I think it's, it's the place. So where you've got um, established, say, ethnic cleavages, then it's much more difficult to kind of bring those groups together. So I wouldn't say, oh yes, you know, a major football event always brings people together, whereas a coronation will generate antipathy between different groups. I think it's much more about the makeup of the population in the given nation and the sort of cleavages that already exist. Okay. So for example, you know, Randall Collins has already been mentioned today. He did a really interesting study uh, after 9-11 looking at the ways in which different groups in the United States commemorated. And what he found was that in African-American communities, no one was displaying the Stars and Stripes. Mm -hmm. No one was really participating in events to kind of commemorate. And his argument was, well, African-Americans don't feel part of America as much as, say, white Americans. And so I, th I think it's, it's rather than looking at the type of event, it's better to look at the type of country 
and the cleavages that exist within any given nation. Thank you. Okay, Ben, okay, I'll try. Okay, oh. I can see you now. It was uh, disconnected. Uh, can you hear me? But our rest is a bit. Hi. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Hello. Hi. So um, I agree with your um, analysis that those um, holidays or events uh, create national uh, feeling, but I'm a bit skeptical about your uh, underlying analysis or underlying uh, idea that there is a distinction between uh, thinking and doing, and the fact that uh, there are things like uh, you're imagining or performance, in a sense, they're the same thing. Uh, not only that they're connected to we do what we think, but also empirically or methodologically, we can't actually know what people are thinking. We can only know what people are doing, what people are saying or wrote. So in a sense, why it's important? I mean, I'm skeptical about this uh, division you make or the dichotomy you make between imagining and uh, Active. See, it's so I want to your response. Okay. Uh, uh, just a second. Uh, Abner has Hi. a follow-up question on this, so please, Abner. Hi, Mike. Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, a follow-up question concerning uh, your resistance to the idea of imagination. Uh, I gather you don't like the uh, uh, idea of imagined community, but when you talk, when you use terms like uh, uh, the nation manifests itself or represents itself of the mm -hmm. as if idea. Mm -hmm. All these terms are uh, directing us towards act, acts of imagination because the nation, if we are talking about a nation of 60, uh, 80 million people, it can only be imagined as one entity. And all these rituals and uh, gatherings that you're talking about are happening within uh, uh, limited constraints about a community or, or perhaps the space of a town, but never on the space of the nation, the entire nation, which should be imagined. I mean, partly, partly this um, setting myself up against Anderson is, is, is a kind of, you know, to provoke a debate. But I also think that I think there is too much emphasis placed on imagination and the cognitive. And I think when you think about these events, when, when people aren't imagining themselves as part of a nation, they are witnessing, they are seeing representations of other people. So in the case of John's uh, example of people clapping. They take part in that activity and then on their social media feeds, they will see other people clapping. They'll pick up the newspaper the next day and they'll see a report about how many people in their nation were clapping. They don't have to imagine themselves as part of a community of people who clap the NHS. They can see it. They can see it through social media, mainstream media. They have conversations with other people. Did you clap last night? Yes, I did. Yeah. So I think there's too much emphasis placed on imagination. And it's much more about representation maybe than it is imagination. Maybe we can uh, uh, distinguish between fabrication and imagining. Okay, but we have time for the last question by Moti, as we asked before. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, media events has cha changed uh, immensely in the age of uh, social media and, uh, and the VOD and the video on, on demand. And uh, they are no longer uh, have this commitment to watch, as Katzen Dayan uh, said. So, uh, what is your take on, on this change uh, of the, the connection between nationalism? And, um, and, uh, and media events in the age of uh, social, social media. And, yeah. and another, another comment is, do you think that uh, ecstatic nationalism is actually the practice of hot nationalism, of building up nationalism? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll start with the first one. I, I do try and make a distinction between ecstatic and hot. So I mean, hot would be kind of more violent, um, 
uh, conflicts, um, you know, war, ethnic conflict, etc., etc. Whereas I think ecstatic is is more about commemoration and celebration. So I, I draw a distinction between those two. Okay. Uh, in terms of the media landscape, yes, you're absolutely right. So when Diane and Katz were writing in the late 80s, you know, in places like Britain, public service broadcasting was king. There was relatively small numbers of channels. Social media didn't exist. And, and I, I, I take that the audience is becoming much more fragmented in the contemporary era. However, I do think that if you look at audience figures, overall they may be falling, but there are certain moments where people still come together for particular events and where you get substantial numbers of people watching and tweeting and posting. And so you do have this, um, this I don't know whether you want to call it community or, or, or group of people that they are directly engaged that vent. Now they may be engaged in a whole variety of different ways. I mean it used to be that perhaps you sat down and watched a public service broadcast of this, but actually now it could be that they're on social media, that they're taking part in a, a party with friends. So I think there is complexity in terms of audiences and they, the way they engage with these events, but I think that if you do look at the audience figures, and also, you know, whether for mainstream or social media, you can see when these events take place, people do still come together around these particular events. And in a, it'll be interesting to see in a, in, in a week or so in Britain, there's the Queen's Jubilee. And it'll be quite interesting to see what the audience figures are, both in relation to mainstream TV, but also social media. But I, I take the point about the fragmentation of the audience. Okay, we have time for the last question by Thomas, and then uh, we... Thank you. Um, Michael, uh, I ask as a psychologist, <clears throat> and I would claim that the imagination or the imagined has to come first, because the event can be exactly the same, and a low-identified person may be repulsed by the same event as a high-identified may really be dragged in, and it depends also how you phrase, say, imagine the event. You can say, wow, the Dutch Königin-Tag is, we have a fantastic monarchy, or we are super Dutch people. Or others would say, ah, oh, it's really good to celebrate with friends, because they just imagine their friend groups. So it's the imagine that precedes, and to which the experience is then generalized, positive or negative. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I think... <laughs> my, my version of imagination is this idea that you're you're kind of sitting down and, and, and thinking about things and you know you're imagining something that perhaps hasn't happened whereas your one seems to be much more expansive so I, again I think do they imagine that they're going to sit down with friends or do they just plan to sit down with friends so they get, you know they contact their friends through social media and say shall we get together for a party Yes. in relation to it's the image. Yeah. But is that process of imagination? I don't know. It, de it depends how you define imagination. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, no more talking. We've been my slightly slippery answer to your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, Michael, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. you can still stay on by Zoom for our last talk. Thank you very much.